Welcome to the MS Dev Show, episode number 158. This week, we talk with Lena Hall about functional programming in F Sharp. Which is faster than mouse or keyboard. Walmart tells vendors to get off Amazon's cloud. And using AI to play Miss Pac-Man. Raygun gives you complete visibility on errors, crashes, and performance problems affecting your end users. Replicate issues in seconds rather than digging through log files or having to rely on users to report errors or crashes. Raygun gives you a window into how users are really experiencing your software applications. Check it out today at raygun.com. This episode of the MS Dev Show is brought to you by Aspose, the market leader of .NET and Java APIs for file business formats. Natively work with DocX, XSLX, PPT, PDF, MSG, MPP, image formats, and many more. This week we have Lena Hall, Senior Engineer in Microsoft Research, writing in F Sharp every day, previously worked on big data distributed systems. Welcome. Hi. So uh, before we get into it, uh, Carl, what's uh, what's going on with that conference? I just want to remind everybody that uh, if you have the chance to go to central Wisconsin at the beginning of August, there is an amazing conference called That Conference, and we will be there. So if that is your cup of tea, uh, check it out. They have all sorts of uh, development stacks, Microsoft and others as well. So if you're looking to just see what's the latest and greatest in in the development sphere in general, uh, it's a great place to go. And once again, we'll be there. So you'll have a chance to uh, connect with both Jason and I. Yeah. And it's literally called that conference. Like I, I was talking to somebody recently and I mentioned that um, and, and they're just like, well, you're going to have to tell me the conference name. <laughs> I'm like, No, it's no, not it's that, that conference. Con- yeah. So we just go, go to we, that conference.com. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, then, and, and buy yourself a ticket. It's actually pretty cheap for a, a three day long national level conference. Exactly. Uh, and then you had a note in here about Slack. Yeah, uh, you know we've been having a, a a bunch of great conversations on Slack. So if you mm-hmm. want to join us on that as well, go to slack.msdevshow.com to send yourself an invitation and uh, check it out. Uh, had a really cool conversation about uh, you know being able to teach yourself certain things and how people teach themselves versus you know being mentored by somebody else on topics. So if you want to have geeky and non-geeky discussions, check it out there. Perfect. And what do we have for the comment of the week? So this week, the comment of the week gets a developer small business license for expose.total for .NET. Um, uh, We got an email from Christoph Vollmer, and he said, uh, hey, guys, I'm listening to your podcast. uh, Hold on. Pretty regularly. I'm commuting to work every day by train. Uh, So lots of time for the podcast. For me, it's a perfect addition to elvinashcroft.com, which he follows daily. Elvin gets a a lot of small ideas and new stuff daily that he can look into or skip. And the MS Dev Show gives him detailed information about things that are of interest most of the time. Uh, He's been on IT 20 years, and he's been working .NET pretty much ever since it's been around. Uh, Staying up to date with all the MS, uh, Microsoft, and .NET stuff is vital vital so he thanks us for the good work and asks us to keep it up Mm -hmm. uh a few things that uh he has comments on is we've been talking a lot about iot and like house temperature stuff Mm -hmm. and he sent us a link if you go to wikipedia and search for passive house uh he says his brother has one and he's about to build one says the temperature is always perfect because it's a whole house system not just insulation uh insulation but also ventilation and other things too so if any of our listeners are into kind of that uh, sphere, uh, check it out. Uh, in addition, uh, he talks about, uh, mentions about when we talked about how Stack Overflow went to HTTPS. Mm-hmm. He says there's been other companies who've been pretty public about their journey into transitioning to HTTPS, such as uh, uh, The Guardian. Um, Okay, so we should include that in the show notes then. Yep, I'll definitely have those links. And he had a couple more, so I'll just put all of his links that he gave us (laughs) out out there because there's more. This is a Um, mega comment. Yeah, and he says he he also has a request to uh, about a podcast on Azure Stack. Um, He's still stuck with on-premise work, so Azure Stack would be a really good candidate. And I think think that's a good feedback because, you know, a lot of times we talk about Azure, but there's that really cool on-premises version that we don't always get to talk about a lot. Yeah, absolutely. 
So if you want to get mentioned on the show like Kristoff, send us an email to feedback at msdevshow.com, comment on Facebook, YouTube, or Stitcher. We especially love those five-star iTunes reviews. Perfect. Okay, let's jump into the news because we got some really cool stuff to talk about here. Uh, the first one is is probably one of the longest articles, but hopefully we can cover it in the shortest amount of time. Uh, is the keyboard faster than the mouse? So it's coming back to this conversation. You want to summarize this, Carl? Yeah. So, I mean, we had uh, Jeremy Foster on a while back talking just about like optimizing and learning keyboard shortcuts because your hands are on the keyboard. They never leave. They must be faster. Well, this article kind of looks at that research that was done in there and says, you know, that might not always be the case. Our, our assumptions might be flawed here and uh, using a mouse might be just as fast as using keyboard shortcuts. So if you want to look at what's probably a good five to 10 minute read, um, there's uh, some pretty good uh, ideas and comments showing that uh, using a mouse uh, might be equally as fast and in some cases faster than using a keyboard shortcut. Yeah, short version, it's complicated. <laughs> yes. So Lena, keyboard or mouse? Uh, you can combine it. I wouldn't say okay. <laughs> one over the other. I yeah. use both. I'm not, I wasn't sure if you were like a purist or not. And, you know, cause like Carl said, we had Jeremy Foster on here and he's just like mouse, you know, unplug it, throw it away, you know, <laughs> keyboard, keyboard for everything. I mean, most of the times when you already know your shortcuts in your editor, you're pretty productive. But if yeah. you switch to somebody else's editor, you're, you're like in a completely new universe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah, that, exactly. that's where I wish some of these were a little bit more embedded in the operating system. Kind of like the keyboard shortcuts to like maybe select a word or select a line. They work really good in, in code and Visual Studio. A lot of times they line them up. But if you switch to another editor or heck, even go to Word or mm -hmm. Notepad, those shortcuts are out the window. I mean, one of one of my favorite ones to use is to delete and or to cut a line is, you know, shift delete. It's just it, it works great in Visual Studio and code, but I wish it worked in Word and the rest of the Office products, mm -hmm. or at least all of the Microsoft sphere. That would be awesome if those could get standardized. I know that there's a whole uh, backwards compatibility issue there that, you know, it'd be hard to make that change, but it would be really nice to uh, make progress towards that. You know what I've been using recently um, a lot is shift alt and then the arrows for whenever you have like a bulleted list, whenever you have an outline for moving items around. Because you can actually use your arrow keys to like indent, unindent, move items around. So I actually did that in the show notes, Carl. Uh, and that one I find to be like just magical. That's probably like my favorite keyboard shortcut ever um, is the ability to do that. Uh, but anyway, this next one here, Microsoft uses AI to beat Miss Pac-Man. Uh, this one I thought was super cool because it's this machine learning problem, right? So AI equals machine learning. Um, you know, that's kind of the short version, right? Uh, but what, what they did was, you know, this is, this is a fairly complex game. So just throwing pure machine learning at it, it, it doesn't quite understand how to play the game. It's sort of complicated. So how do you like break down this problem and make it easier? And it was kind of neat because they basically built a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, AI or ML bots. And what they would do is there was one, for example, that was, um, you know, just a bot to figure out which direction uh, you would ideally go to get away from an enemy. Um, you know, so if the enemy is on, if the ghost is on the right, you know, it's saying go left, go left. And, it, and what it does is it's sending a strong signal that you should go left. Um, meanwhile, there's like another uh, AI bot that's saying, well, you know what? There's pellets over there by that ghost. Um, and it's just less strong of a signal saying, hey, we should go over that way. Um, and what, what ends up happening is whenever you sort of list all these bots and put a weighting to the to the different uh, uh, signals that they're that they're sending, you can figure out, you know, you can aggregate them and figure out the actual direction that you should go. And they maxed out the uh, the score in Ms. Pac-Man. So um, it, it works. It's a cool strategy. And, and I learned a little bit about video games, too. I found out that Ms. Pac-Man is actually a lot uh, less predictable than regular right. Pac-Man. It's not just like they reskinned it. It's it's totally different. Mm -hmm. And then not, not only that, but it's uh, so unpredictable that it's actually one of the hardest uh, early video games to beat and to oh, get that cool. maximum score on. Yeah, because I think in in Pac, I was about to, I was like I was about to say Mr. Pac Man, in, <laughs> <laughs> it's Mr. Man. Um, anyway, in in Pac Man, yeah, uh, my understanding is like you can you can follow you know there's a certain like joystick combination where you can go through and and solve a map and then each one you just do it faster you know so you can sort of memorize like the ideal pattern for Pac Man. Um, I don't know if that's actually true or not, but that was my understanding. And yeah, Miss Pac Man, it doesn't work like that. So. Uh, much more difficult so that's great 
Um, and then, you know, we were, t- we were talking on, on machine learning and, and Carl, you, you'd mentioned, maybe I should bring this up. Um, I, you know, and I don't, I don't know if you guys have this problem and, and I guess you probably don't know cause you might not have cameras, but you know, I have, I have cameras around my house and I actually never really looked at the, the footage cause I usually only look at, look at it whenever something goes wrong. Uh, well, my wife left the, the van unlocked the one day and, or the one night I should say. And everything was like all moved around in there and she goes, what's going on? So I start looking at the, the footage and sure enough, somebody, uh, came by, opened the door and, you know, cause she left it unlocked and was moving through the things. I start going back and here this happens I, from best I can tell it happens every week. Um, <laughs> and it's even different people. People just come, they, they park in the neighborhood and I promise this happens in like all, you know, all different neighborhoods, right? They park their vehicle and they just walk around the entire neighborhood and they check every single car. Um, so I actually have a whole bunch of photos of people trying to, you know, open our van, which, which sits outside. So, you know, the idea here is, um, I, th- I think at some point here, I'm going to train a, a machine learning model, um, use, probably using the, the vision services. Cause I've done this before to identify like different things going on in the, uh, the photos that my uh, security system generates, but you know, I can actually, I should be able to create an ML model that'll actually tell me, Hey, this is a, this is a, a bad person trying to, to break into your, into your vehicle. And then I'll have to do something with, with those signals. But, um, Kind of interesting. Do either do either of you have cameras in the front and park a vehicle outside? No, no. I, I have a garage where we park everything yeah, in, so yeah. we don't have that. But one of the areas I do want is this I have guy a pool. With this giant house. Yeah. <laughs> no, not really. But I, I have a pool, and you know, for just for you know safety concerns, yeah. you know, I want a, a, a camera back there just in case something happens. Mm-hmm. So that would be nice. But, you know, while I'm at it, I might as well surround the house like you have. Exactly. So that's one thing I, I've been thinking about. I just haven't gotten around to. Uh, yeah. Maybe that'll motivate me to document how I set mine up. But I, I, I cover every side of the house. So, uh, But, you know, little did I know that I'm just attempted robberies are happening every week. And it's and I just suspect it's happening everywhere. Like, I don't I don't think there's something unique about our, our neighborhood. Um, the houses out here, I mean, it tends people tend to park outside more because their garages are smaller than than in Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, so I think people tend to park outside more. Uh, next one here. You are not Google. Yeah, I would also like to add to this. You are not Amazon. You are not Microsoft. You are not LinkedIn. You're not Facebook and and so on and so forth. Uh, Really what this article is about is uh, a lot of times when one of these really cool companies create something and publish it, everybody just kind of jumps on it. Uh, One of the examples was back in the day when Google was talking about how they handled their big data solutions. They were talking about MapReduce and Hadoop. And that just took off like wildfire. All of a sudden, everybody had big data and they were all using this Mm -hmm. Um, and and so on and so forth. You know, same with like Cassandra, you know, when that came out, everybody's like, oh, we've got to use that because this company is making it and so on and so forth. But really, I mean, those companies are really optimizing for very specific things. And, you know, if you have the exact same problem that they're having or that fits that technology's strengths and you don't have the weaknesses that, you know, go along with with that, you know, maybe it would be a good fit. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times I really see the the web really just jumping on these uh, these these latest, greatest, cool things. And uh, this guy came with probably one of the worst acronyms ever, unfat with a PH. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he basically says next time we find ourselves like trying to check out this new technology, yeah. uh, we should understand the problem, you know, and, and try to figure out how to solve the problem. Uh, directly. Uh, We should enumerate multiple solutions. Don't just like go with our favorite or go to or whatever this is. I just want to use use my favorites. uh, It says, says, actually look at the paper if there's a paper written on them. Basically research. Also look at the historical context. Weigh the advantages and disadvantages. And and last of all, think. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, so you know, if, if you use those, you're more likely to correct the uh, select the best solution. And this is really hitting me right now because I'm, uh, switching projects at work, uh, as a consultant. And, you know, one of the things that we have is on this one note page that says like technology decisions. And we're, Mm. you know, there's a bunch of them listed out and some of them are like, do we really need a graph database, you know, (laughs) for some of this? I'm like, you know, sometimes the tried and true, you know, the, the plain boring stuff. I was going to say, probably usually usually the answer to that is no. So I I think that's, (laughs) That's why that's 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 a good idea that you're the, the approach that you guys are taking. 
cool yeah i mean i think i think people should uh should ch uh, check this out i think it's a it's a it it will give you some things to think about whenever you're choosing technologies and then uh the last news story here walmart to vendors get off of amazon's cloud which actually makes sense i've actually run into this you know being in kind of the enterprise partner space i've i've actually run into this quite a bit where you know these companies are um you know amazon is in retail so they they are directly competing with you know other retailers so in general retailers are like i'm i don't want to help my competitor well it, it's really interesting because you don't think of you know walmart as a technology company i mean they use a lot of technology mm -hmm. but because they're competing in the retail space like you said they don't want Amazon to succeed in any of Amazon's areas. Mm -hmm. So even though they don't have a stake in the cloud business, they don't want Amazon's cloud to succeed. So they're saying, hey, everybody should be using Azure, Google Cloud, or whatever else that isn't AWS. Mm -hmm. And they so. probably also have this concern of like, you know, storing their data there, but which I think is kind of silly because, I mean, they, they shouldn't, even if they are storing it with Amazon, they shouldn't be trusting Amazon. They should be encrypting it anyway with their own keys and um, but you know, there's always, um, some perceived risk there. So, uh, okay, well let's get to Lena cause we want to talk about F sharp and functional programming, which are some really cool topics. So yeah. I guess let's start with, um, you know, like what is functional programming and then, and then where does, where does F sharp fit into that? Okay. So functional programming is, uh, I would say it's a paradigm mm -hmm. of programming. You can do functional programming in most of the languages. But there are languages which are much easier to do functional programming with, like F-sharp. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really uh, concise. It's easier to debug and troubleshoot with. It's easier uh, to set your mind on the correct programming to be able to uh, find errors quickly and easily and think less like think more about the real thing you're working on and less on like how to actually implement it and do it it does require some um uh, understanding if you have another background let's say if you started with object-oriented language like c-sharp or java it will be um different uh, it is a different paradigm and a different programming language so uh there is definitely a mind shift uh, yeah, that actually brings up like that. You know, I know that the, the way you said that was actually really simple, but it actually kind of blows my mind because now it has me questioning like everything. Right. So when okay. I started, whenever I first got into this, you know, I you, you don't really think about it, but you have to adjust your brain to a certain way of thinking to write code. Right. So if we talk about, you know, C sharp and, and doing things uh, procedurally. Um, you know, you have to like think in a certain way, like I need to do this and then I need to kind of call into this yeah. and then come back. Yes. You're right. And, and, and it, and it seems like functional, you, you said that there's like this mind shift that you have to do, but maybe that mind shift was actually less than, than what, what I had to jump through originally. So, which sort of brings up a good question then. Do you think if you, if you, if you didn't know how to write code at all, do you think functional is closer to like how people actually think? Um, so I have actually uh, seen people who are uh, learning their first programming language that is a functional language. Mm -hmm. And they experience uh, difficulties in switching to object-oriented language. Okay. It, it seems really complicated because, yeah. I mean, in the C Sharp you have loops and you have this certain uh, uh, syntax that you use like uh, like while for and stuff like that, you have uh, exception handling with like null keywords. Um, in functional programming, it's completely different. Like you operate with function composition, uh, you have pattern matching, uh, like carring, you have this uh, monads that you can uh, create uh, that simplify some stuff. Uh, but in general, it, it is not uh, difficult if it's your first, first language. It is just different, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so you you mentioned a, a few things initially, but what what kind of uh, uh, programming tasks are functional languages good for? What are their strengths? Okay, so in general, functional programming is good for general programming. It's uh, some people would say that it's better to do mathematical um, tasks or machine learning or uh, some computa com computationally expensive uh, tasks. Uh, but I would say this is true, but also 
concurrent programming and distributed programming. It's uh, it's really good to do in functional languages first because uh, you have immutability, uh, which is really important when you're working like with data and data operations and distributed environment. So can can you define what that is before you move on? Of course, it means that you do not modify uh, the state of some value every time you you need. Uh, to do some operation, you have a function that has some input parameters and that produces some output value based on the logic that function has. So there are no side effects. So the mm -hmm. function can't just go and uh, cha change some state of something. And so is, that, is that just like, is that a rule then? Like you, you have to do it, you have to do that? I mean, languages like Haskell, for example, they are fully uh, immutable. In okay. F sharp, F sharp has F sharp is not just a pure functional programming language. It also supports object-oriented programming, like mm. comparative programming. Uh, so you can actually do object-oriented programming in F sharp and create mutable um, uh, objects. But for that, you need to use a special keyword that's uh, called mutable. Uh, by default, it is un uh, immutable. Mm -hmm. So it has this bias to immutable programming. But if you want, or if you need it for compatibility reasons, then you can use it. But it's not recommended. Okay. Yeah, I like, um, I like that that it that it show you know like you have to you have to explicitly like go out of your way then to kind of do it the the other way. But you can you can do it if you want. Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So what other kind of strengths does uh, functional uh, languages have? Um, so most of the people who have tried uh, functional programming language uh, after object-oriented language, they say that programming became more logical and uh, easier than it was before. Uh, it helps to find uh, errors more quickly, it, find, it, it helps you to structure your thoughts uh, more clearly and to actually get things done quicker and uh, troubleshoot much quicker and easier. Uh, I know that this sounds kind of like um, not very uh, concrete, mm -hmm. but there are some um, functional programming const constructs and tools that actually uh, make, make it true. For that, for example, F Sharp, it has type inference, uh, function composition, uh, calling, pattern matching. Uh, it has type providers and computation expressions. These are like language features uh, that make it uh, make up the benefits of functional programming in F Sharp. Uh, Don't wait for users to report problems. Raygun gives you complete visibility on errors, crashes, and performance problems affecting your end users. Replicate issues in seconds rather than digging through log files or having to rely on users to report errors or crashes. Raygun gives you a window into how users are really experiencing your software applications, supports all major programming languages and platforms, and integrates with your current development workflow tools too. There's a free 14-day trial, and it takes minutes to implement. So start resolving issues in your application and check it out today at raygun.com. And now you mentioned that, that you could find like errors more easily um why is that because I, I i find myself like when i'm in when i'm in c sharp and let's say i'm working with like a list or something like that or i'm, I'm doing even like a link expression um i have this i'm just not very smart so i have this terrible habit of like i end up um sort of setting a variable and i do like one operation and then i kind of do the next operation separate and i you know like i'm super verbose in my code um, instead of trying to make it like compact and concise. And part of that is so I can like step through it and like each step of the along the way, I can sort of validate like, okay, I, I, I found these items and now I'm transforming them in this way and now I'm doing this thing. So like, uh, what does that look like in functional programming? Like how, how do I, if I, if I screwed up this like block of code or maybe it isn't a block, I don't even know. In, in functional programming, how do I, how do I know like what I screwed up? Okay, so first of all, in F Sharp, you don't have null pointer exceptions uh, <laughs> at all. Okay, well, my code is pretty bug free, like <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah, uh, but seriously, I mean, the, the absence of uh, null pointer exceptions is uh, it's a, a huge plus. Yeah. You can you can just use a uh, pattern matching and option types. Like your value can be some type or it can be none, so you can handle all of your. Uh, cases appropriately. Okay. There is nothing unexpected that can happen in your functions. 
but uh, also you you can create modular functions that have their own responsibility. They just mm -hmm. take the input and they produce something out of it. And if there is an error, you with simple debugging, you can if there are no side side effects, you can just find out and uh, narrow it down to one function, and then you simply fix the error. So usually, like for me, when I write code in F Sharp, uh, if it compiles, it works hundred uh, percent. Uh, if it, I mean, you can you can uh, you can try to prototype something really quickly. If it doesn't look good, you just rewrite it, write it again, uh, split it up to more functions, and and compile it. It works. Yeah, I feel like you know. I, so first of all, like uh, Anders, I think he said that he wishes like null wasn't, you know, wasn't like the default in, in C sharp, like it didn't exist by default. Like you, you should have to do something. You should have to go out of your way to, to make that the case. And, and man, I really wish it wasn't in there because especially <laughs> now, whenever we're working with like these data structures and you have things that are there and things that aren't there. Um, yeah, I always run into these cases where um, I'm checking like everything along the way. Um, and JavaScript makes it a lot easier. And I know C sharp has added some things where it's like, um, you know, you can put like these question, these funny question mark things in and say like, well, if it's not null then keep going and, you know, it feels like we've been just been putting a whole bunch of band-aids on it. So it sounds like, it sounds like F sharp just handles that better right out of the box. Yeah. And another thing to mention. So if you look at C sharp code and F sharp code, mm -hmm. it looks kind of different because, uh, F sharp uses the indent based, uh, approach. So mm -hmm. you don't have this curly braces and you don't have uh, semicolons. Uh, it makes code cleaner um, and like it avoids the unnecessary constructions that create uh, people can call it code noise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it just simplifies creating simple uh, data structures or objects. So it makes data modeling really easy. Uh, it also has uh, a sharp interactive. Uh, it's like a special uh, console window or you can open up open it up from Visual Studio or from any editor that allows you to really quickly prototype some, some things and immediately see the result. Um, so you can create scripts. Uh, Sharp is great for scripting, for example. Um, so. Okay. Um, and then, you know, so the, hypothetically, if I'm a developer that already knows like C Sharp and JavaScript and some of these other things, like, um, and I say, oh, you've sold me on F Sharp. Like, how, how do I... How do I make that transition? Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of great resources online. Mm -hmm. I think the most famous and the most loved resource called uh, F-Sharp for fun and profit .com. Uh, It has a lot of basic tutorials on how to get started and how to get used to this functional paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, so F-Sharp community is a unique community that is really friendly, welcoming, helpful, supportive. Uh, there is a sharp Slack where you can write questions. Uh, even if you post, there is there is even uh, like a joke that if you're new to F sharp and if you want to have F sharp friends, you just post a tweet with F sharp hashtag and you'll have immediately, you'll have uh, uh, likes and responses and you'll get help. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's uh, motivating. So, so is that, is that, that's, so that's pound, F pound. <laughs> F hush. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, because that, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how Twitter handles that. That's got to be interesting. Yeah. It's just uh, sharp and then F sharp. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then, and then I, I actually, I went to uh, a, a friend of mine, Bill Barry, and I asked him, because he, he's like, he, he he's considers himself a, a bit of an F sharp, sharp guy. And I said, I asked him for like, what, what questions I should ask you. And he mm -hmm. wanted me to ask you a follow up on that question, which was, am I already doing fun functional programming and I just don't know it? I mean, you know it if you do functional programming. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I know like, you know, there's there's things in C sharp and, and in JavaScript, too. Okay. I know, you know, I've done a lot of, of stuff in, in JavaScript and I know that, you know, it's sort of I think there's some things that border on functional programming. So I don't yeah. I don't know how true that is or not. I would say. F sharp is getting more and more functional these days. Mm -hmm. It's just it just grabbing features from F sharp uh, mm -hmm. one by one, <laughs> and I think by let's say F sharp twenty or something, it will just be like F sharp renamed into C sharp. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but um, but for the time being, I'm just a big faker at the at the at the <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so C sharp 
already has uh, uh, like tuples, right? So that you can return multiple mm -hmm. values. So from a function, it it uh, has pattern matching already, some sort of pattern matching. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think Shark still has uh, the majority of functional features. Um, so I agree that uh, right now, currently, most of the languages are getting uh, the functional features in it. And some people who are not used to it can just can just say, oh, that's a new feature. And they might not know that it might be original from functional programming, like, like Lambdas or stuff like that. OK. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so also another thing to mention about F-sharp, uh, you have a lot of freedom uh, what uh, frameworks to use or what editors to choose uh, to program in it. Like uh, Visual Studio is, is not the most popular IDE that, that is used for F-sharp, for example. Really? OK. Uh, yeah, so there is VS Code, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uses uh, ionide plugging that was originated from community, uh, so it was written by I think uh, Christoph, uh, and VS Code incorporated the this uh, plugin, and you can notice if you write uh, a sharp in I mean if you write in a sharp in a VS Code, uh, every day you have new updates, so like okay. new functionality, um, it's it's really good. Um, also, so, so sharp, that's a so that so it's a pretty good experience in VS Code then. Like if I'm starting out, should, is that maybe what I should look at? I think you should look at it definitely because it's really quick. It, That's cool. it's, lo it's loading very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, you just type uh, extend like a sharp extension. Yep. It downloads Ionide and you're good to go. And it works uh, in many platforms. So you can you can basically use any That's OS. Cool. Like I I'm writing a sharp on my Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, I have. Uh, I haven't installed uh, Visual Studio for Mac just to try it out, but mostly I use VS Code. Mm -hmm. um, very cool. And then you, you mentioned like F sharp turning into C sharp. So, I mean, do you like, do you really see, do you, do you see them like converging at some point or, I mean, are they going to become so similar that I can sort of jump back and forth? Like what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's knowing, a very complicated yeah, question. Yeah. Knowing, knowing that, you know, this isn't like an authoritative answer, which is fine. <laughs> it just seems like um, it, C sharp and C sharp community is not ready for it yet. Okay. It needs some time to uh, get used to the things that exist and that can make you more productive. I guess yeah. um, some of them like like curly braces and uh, like the existing <laughs> C sharp syntax. So, um, but I, think I, I love that, that some of them like curly brackets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what yeah. is wrong with these people? <laughs> <laughs> have no idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I think that C sharp is uh, going the right way in looking around and mm -hmm. seeing what good parts it can take into. Uh, so hopefully one day C sharp will have most of the functionality that's necessary for productive functional programming. Okay. Well, but right now, on. functional programming is definitely. It is possible to do functional programming in C sharp, mm -hmm. but in F sharp, it's so much more easy. So, okay, just simplifies it a lot. So F sharp is in the same family of languages uh, as like C sharp and VB, in that they both compile or they all compile down to IL. So okay. since they all do that, what what do I have to do? Like if if I have some C sharp code and I have some F sharp code to start referencing them from each other. You can do it. Uh, you you can create a library in C sharp and use it from F sharp. Or for example, there are some tools that are written in F sharp that are used from C sharp. Uh, it is easy. Uh, you mentioned that F sharp is from the family of uh, C sharp and uh, Visual Basic languages. But it also, I think, the inspiration for F sharp was. Uh, uh, OCaml, which is another uh, functional language mm -hmm. uh, from the ML family. And I think you can also do some interop with uh, OCaml in this, in like in this topic. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So um, it's interesting, you know, because it, it does compile down to IL, right? I mean, it obviously is if they're, if they're, so I'm going to ask you a question that I, I, you know, it's okay if you don't know how to answer this one, but um, and I'm not, it's so complicated. I'm not even sure how to ask it. Um, you know, so obviously, like IL itself 
is able to represent the F sharp code that you're writing, right? So you're writing this functional code. Um, have you ever looked at kind of how that's represented and, and can, you know, can you do like the same code in C sharp? I don't know if I, I'm not quite sure what I'm asking. It's like, you're trying, can you convert the code? From no, it's not, no, it's not even a matter of, con well, I guess that's actually a good question. But the other <laughs> thing I guess is does, so does that mean that IL has special representations for the things that you do in F sharp? So those are my two questions. It does some, I think, okay. I think some of the constructions are different. Okay. Um, that's why that, that, makes, that makes sense. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of what I was thinking. I mean, yeah, and then the other one, yeah, that, that was a good question. Can you convert between the two? Haven't tried it, actually. <laughs> I didn't think about it. <laughs> yeah, you, um, I, w I would assume you could go C sharp well, to F sharp easier than you could go the other way. But I'm not cause, sure. Because I know that like a lot of the code converters nowadays, like from like C sharp and VB, use like Roslyn under the hood. So you can kind of you know, yeah. get that representation. So it would be interesting to see if uh, you could kind of do something similar with F sharp. Yeah, but it, you know, they work really well with like VB.net and C sharp because those languages essentially have parity and, and all, mm -hmm. you know, equivalent operations. But in the F sharp world, like there, it's just, it's just like fundamentally different. Um, so I'm thinking if it did work, you might not like the code. It's kind of like link to SQL where, you know, just because you can write a certain link query doesn't mean that you should because it's getting, you know, converted into 12 lines of uh, SQL server code, which oh, will work. If you're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've yeah. seen like a one liner on, on link get yep. like a thousand plus lines in SQL. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll work. I mean, that's the beautiful good. thing. It will work, but you know, it's not, it's just not a good. Do you want it to? Yeah. Um, so we keep hearing, you know, we keep hearing C sharp, you know, is, is, is evolving over time. Um, you know, like is F sharp, you know, since I really don't follow the F sharp scene, um, you know, I think you mentioned like VS code getting daily updates. So is F sharp like continuing to evolve quickly as well? I would say it evolves more quickly <laughs> and it, okay. it is, it is fully open source. It is cross platform. It has a great strong community. And it has a lot of open source contributors. Uh, like most of the work comes from open source contributors. Okay. So wow. I, F Sharp has a F Sharp Software Foundation, which is like an, a nonprofit organization that uh, its mission is to uh, promote, protect, and advance F Sharp uh, programming language and uh, like facilitate the growth and uh, diversity of the language. So. Uh, I would say F Sharp has built a unique environment for open source contributors and uh, for new ideas to grow into something real that can be like, that can be created and put to work and made made it be used by other people in the community. So that's why we have VS Code plugging. Uh, for example, there is. Um, you know, there is a Visual Studio compiler uh, for F Sharp, but there is also F Sharp compiler services, which is independent and which, for example, is can be used by other IDEs that are not dependent uh, from Visual Studio. So have you heard about Project Rider, for example? Mm -mm. So it's, uh, have you heard of ReSharper? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the same company uh, that uh, owns ReSharper, they have created Project Rider, which is an IDE for C Sharp and F Sharp, which if you miss ReSharper in a sharp world, you can use you can use it, and I okay. think it uses the this compiler services. Uh, you can do mobile development uh, in F Sharp with Xamarin Studio for Android, for iPhone, for many platforms. Yeah, Frank Krieger made uh, Continuous completely in exactly. F Sharp, and we're like, Are exactly. you crazy man, and he's like, yeah. oh, I love it. <laughs> like you can just take your I iPad and just do programming in F Sharp, and it's yeah. super cool. It works. Yeah. So there is. Um, Distributed programming in F Sharp. You can use uh, Alka .net. Um, uh There is there is uh, a new uh, F Sharp binding to TensorFlow like for mm -hmm. machine learning. Uh, Hopac for uh, multi-core processing. Uh, of course, we can do cloud programming not only with Azure or Azure Functions, but a Sharp uh, community created like a, a special optimized for functional programming cloud uh, library called Embrace mm -hmm. that simplifies how you do cloud programming uh, with the help of computation expressions. So you basically, you have your code that we, you would normally write 
and you just wrap it around in a cloud block and mm -hmm. it distributes your function across the cloud. And you can use it with Azure or AWS, for example. Okay. Aspose offers a powerful set of file management APIs with which developers can create applications, which can create, open, edit, and save the majority of popular business file formats. Their product range supports a multitude of file formats, including Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint presentations, PDF documents, OneNote, Outlook, Project, Visio files, popular image formats, and many others. Aspose produces APIs for .NET, Java, and the cloud, which can be utilized in almost any modern language available today. Visit Aspose.com for a free 30-day no limitations trial, and if you get stuck, message the friendly support team for help. All technical support is offered free of charge. And remember, if you are a lucky winner, you will receive a free developer small business license for Aspose.net, a powerful toolkit for working with Word documents in your applications. Are, are there like equivalent like uh, like templates for like the mainstream kind of like uh, Microsoft platforms like ASP or like just like a, a console app writing that in F Sharp, maybe UWP? It, do, does that exist and work well? Um. I'm not working in a sharp team that actually like, yep. do, does the Microsoft compatibility, but I think there are some templates for Web API or okay. ASP.NET. Um, not sure about Universal Windows Platform because I think that was mm -hmm. an open question some time ago, mm -hmm. um, but I think it is in progress. And I so, would think the console app would be there as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. You, yeah. you can do the basic uh, stuff that you can do with C Sharp. You can use uh, Azure Functions uh, with F Sharp. Um, so there is this stuff, but I think, so Microsoft has a sharp team, mm -hmm. uh, that is just a couple of people. Uh, I think, uh, Philip Carter is a, a program manager on this, on this team and they're doing great, great work. Um, uh, so I wish F sharp had, had more support, uh, from within mm -hmm. Microsoft. So I wish Microsoft team was. Uh, like uh, not a couple of people, but like let's like say at, at <laughs> least seven or or ten. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then maybe it would be possible to have better <laughs> interrupt with Microsoft uh, tools mm -hmm. and F Sharp because the majority of um, work on frameworks is done by community. Yeah. So you mentioned that they're their own special small team, but do they work alongside the other .NET language teams or are they just really siloed doing their own thing? I think they're working uh, within the .NET organization, uh, but I'm not really sure. Mm. It's better okay. to ask uh, FRPM, but I think they're working on .NET slash F Sharp. Yeah. Okay. But it sounds like too, I mean, it, with all the, with the massive community around this, I mean, because the, you know, I hate labeling, but like the, the, you know, you F sharp people are, are, <laughs> are like, <laughs> are super, I mean, you guys are, are super passionate and vocal about it. Um, so obviously it's like something that's, that's really cool. Cause you know, it's funny. Cause you know, when you ask me like, you know, so, uh, something about, C, uh, about something about F sharp, it's like, oh, Frank Krieger, Bill Berry, Lena Hall, like. Like, I know you guys, you know, I know, like, yeah. I know that I know the names because, you know, you guys are doing like such cool work with it and I'm kind of jealous, but yeah, it's that, that massive uh, community that you have around it. I think you have, I mean, that's like something that's like super special for, for F sharp there. I mean, I, I also want to mention a really like important thing uh, mm -hmm. that I think should be mentioned, uh, at uh, .NET fringe conference, uh, last year, not this year. We had uh, Don Syme presenting uh, on the topic about F Sharp, mm -hmm. and he mentioned a really interesting thing. Uh, so he came up with a term that's called memetic independence. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about it? No, no. Explain. Okay, okay. So memetic independence is uh, when a technology can be virally communicated as an idea independently of other technologies, associate associations, and uh, vested interests. So that means. Uh, basically, you can you can talk about F Sharp independent from other tools or companies or technologies uh, as a as of an independent uh, technology and entity, and that is the thing that F Sharp has. Uh, uh, for example, when you search uh, some technical keyword and when you see that results lead to one company, 
that is probably not mimetic independence. Mm -hmm. Or when uh, your first sentence trying to explain the technology always contains like the same the same company, the same tool uh, name, and like the same editor. That means it's probably not mimetic independence. So. F Sharp tries to be very cross-platform and very broad and wide and open to everything, so to all use cases. So it's not only Windows; it's Linux or OS X and uh, like uh, Windows too. So mm -hmm. the editors can be anything. You can develop on any platform, and this is where uh, the language tries to go to. That's that's really cool. I like that. Um, I, I think that is a big strength. Um, anything else that you wanted to, to mention about functional programming or about F-sharp? Um, I have a lot of things to mention uh, also <laughs> about uh, like about F-sharp mm -hmm. things, F-sharp uh, libraries that exist or F-sharp tools. Sure. So, uh, you know, uh, NuGet, right? Yeah. So have you heard of Packet? No. So Packet is a dependency manager that is written in F Sharp, and it is used not only for F Sharp solutions. It is really popular for C Sharp projects or other .NET projects. Um, it is it is designed well to work with NuGet packages, but also it enables uh, referencing files like directly from uh, Git repositories or any HTTP resource. Mm. And it uh, it makes it really easy to version yeah, and install the packages. Yeah, npm has some mm -hmm. of that functionality where yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, oh, there's no package, so I'm just going to point it at the GitHub repo. Yeah, another recent thing is uh, so F# -sharp has this uh, library called Fable, uh, which you can you can write write your front end in F# -sharp. Uh, basically, Fable is an open source uh, compiler from F# -sharp to JavaScript. Which, which is inspired by TypeScript. Uh, and it produces a really understandable, nice, clean JavaScript. Hmm. Uh, yeah. That's kind of interesting. Any, anything else on your list? You have, you have uh, the floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you're interested in F Sharp, I recommend to uh, attend a conference in San Francisco in September. Okay. Uh, it is called Open F Sharp. It is the first conference on uh, F Sharp in the United States on the West Coast, uh, and I'm speaking there. <laughs> uh, so I think it will be great. It will be very should be very similar to uh, .NET Fringe Spirit. It is like community oriented. Uh, it should be very friendly, welcoming. If you want to get started, uh, I think it will be a great starting point. Okay, and if I do want to get if I do want to learn F Sharp, like what what's my first Go to resource. Um, I mm -hmm. search. I search for like F Sharp tutorial, and it sent me to tryfsharp.org. Like, is that where I want to start? Uh, I think the best one is to use F Sharp for fun and profit .com. Okay. Um, yeah, try F Sharp. We're currently working on it uh, within F Sharp Software Foundation to like make it work uh, for beginners. And also another great thing I forgot to mention about F Sharp Software Foundation. So if you're new. There is a, this great uh, free mentorship program. So basically, F Sharp experts they provide some time for beginners to like to mentor them. Uh, you have about thirty minutes uh, a week, I think, and they guide you. They recommend you resources. They they try out some projects with you, uh, and I mean, as as soon as you become better in F Sharp, you can mentor somebody else. So it's for free and it's great you can benefit from this opportunity. Okay, very cool. Anything else you wanted to mention before we move on? Um, just don't be afraid to try it. Uh, it's really great. You will be not able to go back to C Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that makes it sound pretty good. Very awesome. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, so I actually have a hardware pick of the week, uh, which is kind of an unusual one here. So I, you know, I have a wireless access point with a built-in, uh, you know, obviously regular Wi-Fi routers have a router plus they're an access point. I actually wanted to split out that router function so that I could do things like VPN and and uh, some of this other functionality and also just kind of offload some of that processing off my Wi-Fi access point um, because most of, you know, the vast majority of my network is, is wired and... You know, I don't know, wi wireless access points, it seems like because of all the complexity involved are, are a little bit less reliable than uh, 
uh, you know, than, than like business grade routers. So I was looking for a business grade router, like enterprise grade router that was affordable. And I found one that fit the bill better than I ever thought could be possible, which is a product from Ubiquity called uh, Edge Router X. This thing is basically like a you know small business or enterprise class router for fifty dollars, uh, which is pretty phenomenal, and it supports QoS and VPN, and uh, it's got a couple hundred megabits of of throughput. I even do like deep packet inspection. Uh, you can SSH into it and drop into a, a shell and and start uh, and start changing network parameters because it's based on Linux. Um, this thing is like really incredible. It even has PoE support. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know how they sell the thing for $50, but, um, you know, since I got it, I've been like making network configuration changes and you know, I got up and running with this thing in about 20 minutes and I keep making changes to it and I have, I've yet to have to reboot and, uh, reports online say this thing will stay running for months and months and months without, uh, without issue. So I'm pretty excited about it. So we'll have a link to that in the show notes if you want to take a look at that. And then Carl, what are you for the dev tip of the week? So, uh, the, Tip of the week this week is a T SQL statement. Uh, <laughs> a, a, a lot of us, you know, we, we learned really quickly that you want to save as much date information as UTC as possible. Mm -hmm. And I follow that advice at work as well. Well, uh, we got to a spot that, you know, normally we would handle it in code where you, you convert it to the local time wherever necessary. But when you're doing stuff like having Power BI or maybe some other kind of things hooking directly to your database to query this, you know, you there is no code to interact with. So uh, I found there's a, uh, a T-SQL statement called switch offset. So if you want to uh, convert from one offset to another, if you have the time zone information in there, or if you know that it's UTC and you want to convert to a local time and you know what that offset is, you could just give it that offset and this will do all the date math for you. So it's switch offset and you give it the date object. And I think it takes all of the different date objects. So if you have date time two, date time offset, all that, It'll just work as well as the offset you want. So it's super simple and actually worked really good for some of the stuff that I've been doing lately. Very cool. Okay, Lena, we play a game on the show. What I need to do is pick a number between one and four inclusive and let me know what it is. And I will ask you a question that's meant for like eight year olds. <laughs> I don't know. Let's pick one. Pick one. Okay. Would you would you rather always have a little green piece of spinach stuck between your front teeth or always have a little booger in your nose that moves when you breathe? <laughs> oh, I would rather have a sweet tea on a summer afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, nobody's done that before. Like you, you're really thinking outside the box there. <laughs> there's no there's not enough room to like write it in, though. Sweet tea. You have to pick uh -huh. one of the existing options, unfortunately. Oh, it's not me. Um, it's the law. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like spinach. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would think it would become, uh, you know, it would lose flavor after a while. So, yeah. So would you rather have that in your teeth or the booger in your nose? Oh, do I still have to choose? <laughs> yeah, you still have to choose. <laughs> okay. she, she's trying to avoid it, James. I know. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, if it's binary, it's, let's shuffle it and pick uh, zero. <laughs> <laughs> or do you want do you want the next question? I can give you the next, next one if you question. want. Okay, the next one is it might be worse. <laughs> yeah. No. Would you rather have your parents give you a pet pig or a big pet snake? I like I like how different, uh, you know, these questions are. <laughs> oh, um, so I guess it's some American terms for things that parents make. I am from Eastern Europe, so I've never had both this either of them, so I can't decide. No, it's the, the animal, yeah, a, a pet pig or a big snake. Um, like a mini pig, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was gonna say like that. That one's a pretty easy answer because, um, yeah, yeah, some of those pigs are actually make really good pets. Okay, Carl, pick a number. I'll take number four. Number four. Would you rather not be able to read or not be able to talk? Man, that that's actually a pretty rough one. Nope, it's I, easy I, for I'm me. Pretty, yeah. I, I think I'd have to go with if I can't read, I can't do my job. I don't know. Yeah. I mean that, that was pretty rough. I don't I guess at that point I'd have to choose not being able to speak. Yeah. That's I would I think I would pick the same thing. Especially with how dependent on computers, because I I assume you could still like type, right? So I mean I could mm -hmm. I just live my life through the computer. I you know copy Steve, Stephen Hawking's voice. Now that you know that app is open source, so I could do that. 
But it's a WinForms app. Yeah, well, whatever. I can I can deal with that. Centennialize. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Lena. So we'll have a link to like all the stuff we talked about in the show notes. But uh, where can people find you and follow you? Uh, I think. The main place is uh, Twitter. You mm-hmm. can also add me on LinkedIn, uh, or you can follow me on GitHub. Usually, if you have any questions, you can ask ask it on Twitter. I have okay. my DMs open. So. What's your What's your handle on Twitter? It's at Lena Droid. Okay, Lena Droid. Perfect. Uh, okay, and Carl, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Carl Schweitzer. And you can find me at YTechie.com or on Twitter at Twitter.com slash YTechie. So, Lena, thank you so much for coming on here and talking about functional programming and F Sharp. It, it got me pretty excited about taking a look at this again and seeing what I can use it for. Thank you. I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs>